On this episode of TransLogic, a century-old automaker remains on the cutting edge. We tour Ford's Silicon Valley Research Centre with CEO Mark Fields and get a closer look at the hotly anticipated Ford GT. A partnership with Georgia Tech showcases the future of parking, and we see some innovative ways the automaker reduces employee wear and tear. Welcome to TransLogic, I'm Jonathan Buckley. We live in a time where the line between technology and transportation has merged. Whether it's infotainment systems, safety features, or even the build of the car itself, cutting edge technology is helping to guide where the auto industry is going. And that's why Ford has made the switch between Dearborn to Silicon Valley for their all new research and innovation center. <laughs> Well, I'm feeling very privileged to be standing here in front of one of the most beautiful cars I've ever laid eyes on with the guy that's in charge of the whole thing, Mark Fields, president and CEO of Ford Motor Company. In this facility, you're researching a lot of different areas from automated driving, composites, lightweight materials. Yep. How is that all going? Coming here to Silicon Valley, we really want to make a lot of progress on mobility, autonomous vehicles, using analytics. So coming to Silicon Valley was a very deliberate part on us to go to where the talent is, but also importantly to be part of the community here. Yeah. As Ford sort of looked around, knocked on a few doors next door and said, hey, would you like to come across and uh, join the team? Well, that's that's one of the benefits of being here. When you're part of the community, you begin to build relationships. And you know, we can go right down the road and meet with companies. And these relationships yep. lead to technical opportunities and they lead to innovative new ideas. What are we working on here at the Research and Innovation Center? The, the central theme of the work we do here is around our, our strategy, what we're calling Ford Smart Mobility. Right. And thinking about all of these technologies through the lens of what does it mean to the customer? I read a little something about Nest and yes. home integration with your car. How does that work? So Nest is right up the street. It's a great okay. example of why being here matters. Yep. We're creating a connected ecosystem where the vehicle sends a message to your smart home saying, I'm about to arrive. Please turn on the uh, either the cooler or the heater if it's yeah. cold outside so that I, I'm comfortable when I come into my home. InfoCycle is using the Ford developed open innovation platforms to allow you to interact with signals from a vehicle. We're connecting an open XC enabled uh, sensor to a bicycle that can then communicate with a back-end computer to then analyze, well, how are you riding that bike and how's that bike interfacing with other vehicles on the road? It's yep. gonna help us learn how we can improve that experience. Well, let's talk about the elephant in the room. It's actually a gazelle, if you remember. Oh, it's a gazelle. <laughs> it's a beautiful. The Ford GT. It's such an iconic vehicle. When you think about uh, the GT, the balance is always, how do you make the design look progressive and forward-looking without you losing the bloodlines yeah. of what makes it a GT? And I think our team has done a wonderful job on that, on keeping those bloodlines in there. What are some of the big things that you've added to this car? I mean, the lightweight components mm -hmm. alone are a major leap forward. But it's really a decade's worth of innovation in areas of light weighting, in areas of EcoBoost engines, and in areas of aerodynamics. The passenger cell and the driver cell is carbon fiber. Yep. The front and rear structures are aluminum. The body panels are carbon fiber. It keeps the car light, so you get great power to weight ratio great driving dynamics, and a very lightweight vehicle, but one that still stays planted on the ground. Pretty much any supercar we drive nowadays, any sports car, has some kind of uh, software assistance for the driver. Yeah, we'll have um, you know traction control, stability control, torque vectoring, uh, active aerodynamics, active ride control, and we spend a lot of time making sure that the intervention of those systems comes in very smoothly and fluently, and, and hopefully the driver doesn't notice. While it wasn't designed here in Palo Alto, a lot of the technologies have their heritage in the research and innovation organization for years, like lightweighting technology, EcoBoost was invented by the research team, dynamics and controls capabilities, yeah. all of those are the heritage building blocks, if you will, that, that have made the GT possible. Okay, so there's, a, there's an imaginary car 
in front of me, yeah? Right. I'm talking of the HMI or the human machine interface, we have a sort of a setup here in this facility right here where we can actually virtually tour around the GT. We've got a, a headset, very similar to an Oculus headset. Yep. Um, it's got all the engineering data in it and we can walk, literally visually walk around the vehicle. Can I bang into it by accident? Like, <laughs> It can, won't hurt. <laughs> to get a sense of the proportions of the vehicle. I feel like I'm a car thief but trying, yeah. to find, <laughs> trying to find the wires. But yeah. for us as engineers, even more importantly, when we see all the interfaces, we can actually stick our head into the vehicle and it'll cut engineering sections. Yeah. And all the engineering data behind that, we can see how all the parts are mating together. Oh, no way. So I can see the engine and everything. Yeah. When it comes to pricing the GT, there hasn't really been any solid price given. Mm -hmm. There's been murmurings that it's around the 400,000 mark to go and spend that type of money on essentially a V6. You think people might have a little bit of trouble appreciating that, appreciating that at first? Well, what's, what's great about the, the supercar market is it's very performance based. And so the numbers that we'll be getting, uh, we think that's a pretty competitive price for the type of car that we're talking about. Right. Plus the benefits is not only do you get a more fuel efficient uh, yeah. supercar, but a, with that smaller displacement engine, it frees up the designers to be even more uh, bold. So when you see the, the cockpit on this, how it tapers towards the end, like a fighter jet, you're able to do that because you can wrap the carbon fiber yeah. around the engine a lot more tightly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, excellent. Obviously we haven't had a chance to drive it yet. I'm gonna talk to you about that in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> What we've seen here today has definitely got us excited for the future of Ford and for the auto industry as a whole. Clearly, Ford want to lead the pack when it comes to this new technology paradigm shift. We just hope everybody else is paying attention. A little later, Ford puts us through the ringer. But first, remote controlled parking. So the whole thing's pretty intuitive. It works exactly as you imagine a golf cart would work. <laughs>remote vehicle repositioning you guys have been so far using golf carts that's right what's the goal with this type of technology we recognize that there's a lot of trends happening that are driving mobility so at Ford we created 25 experiments to learn experiment and understand where we might need to go next as you probably know uh, car sharing is becoming one of the emerging trends in, in mobility right. so with that any type of uh, sharing program that we looked at around the world one of the common challenges it has is that during um, the end of the day or the nighttime hours, there's something that has to happen to get all the assets back to where they need to be for the next day. Cell phone technology and, and broadband technology has advanced so far that we can re remotely control a vehicle from anywhere in the world. So for example, we could actually take this and create a virtual valet you and your significant other pull up to a, say, a restaurant. You could potentially get out of your vehicle and then the call center could take your vehicle and park it for you and you wouldn't need to do anything else other than arrive at the restaurant. So the whole thing's pretty intuitive. It works exactly as you imagine a golf cart would work. The only difference that there really is is there's just a little bit of latency that you have to account for and obviously that's because we've got to send a signal to the actuators and the actuators have to take effect. 
it's lunchtime here, which means it's kind of busy. So there's actually a bit of traffic and there's some foot traffic as well that I kind of have to pay attention to. But with the three cameras mounted, you get a really wide field of view. And as long as you pay attention, I'm really finding this actually quite easy. With the current setup that we have right now, we have valet drivers on staff, uh, you know, moving cars. Would yep. this be a more efficient way? Absolutely, because from one location, say here in, in an office, you could link up with the vehicle, move it, and then go to the next vehicle, et cetera. So one driver could essentially take a whole army of vehicles and move them around as needed. Whenever we talk about things like this and remote or autonomous driving, mm -hmm. The first thing that comes to mind is safety. We are using encryption. We are um, looking to, uh, as we move this and progress this further from an experiment phase, understand what we need to do to address some of the challenges. I have actually talked to the guys uh, downstairs and they said that there is a LiDAR system strapped to the front of the car, which is basically a proximity sensor that is not going to allow me to go rogue. So if I decide to go a bit mental in this car and start running down students, it will actually stop as soon as it realises that there's an obstacle in front of me. When it comes to Ford as a company looking at these parking solutions, some other companies have gone with automation. Why is it you've gone with remote? Ford is, is extremely interested in autonomous vehicles and we've declared that we're working on it and that we do believe that technology right. will be feasible in the midterm. What is so nice about this technology is that um, there's always this understanding or this concern that policy may not move as quickly as the technology. And considering this is running over the LTE network, which I'm having a hard time with, with my phone today, this car, we've been driving now for a good 10, 15 minutes or so, and we haven't had any brakes in transmission yet, so it's pretty solid. One of the other areas that you've been working on as well um, is parking in the city and, and parking around town and finding those parking spots. So you guys are addressing this with a, is it a parking spotter? That's right, we call it the parking spotter, and it really started with looking at data coming off of vehicles today and understanding how much time is wasted uh, for people hunting uh, for parking. And then you think about where navigation has gone, right? Navigation now is started with just getting you where this location is, then it started mapping the best route from A to B. Well, our vision is that, wouldn't that be nice? The navigation only got you from A to B, but it also got you parking. We said, could us, Ford Motor Company, could we take a look at how we might be able to become a probe? And that's really what Parking Spotter is. It's taking the vehicle, and as it drives into a known parking area, the system is turned on, and then this ultrasonic sensors that are on the side of the vehicle that are already there for other features right. start scanning both left and right and mapping out open spaces and occupied spaces. Yep. And that information is then uploaded to the cloud, yep. and then it's accessible by other customers. Our ultimate goal is to reduce emissions and reduce waste, and parking is a big contributor. Some statistics and some of our data shows that in urban centers, 20 to 30% of a vehicle's emissions is used just for parking. Well, it's great to see a couple of institutions taking on some areas of driving that really aren't that much fun. Moving around fleets of vehicles and finding a place to park them. Let's hope that this technology really gets up and running so that we can get behind the wheel and really start to do the fun stuff. Up next, robot test drives and virtual manufacturing. Kind of nice that Ford are so concerned about the well-being of their employees. I wish the same could be said for the producers at TransLogic. It's no surprise that big car companies like Ford put their cars through some fairly rigorous testing prior to launch. Some of this testing really can beat the you-know-what out of them. Just so what they've done is come up with some nifty technology which has helped make the workplace a whole lot safer. How long ago did uh, Ford start toying around with using autonomous driving for the testing? We started this project in about 2011, and then we finally got to the point where the technology looked far enough along where we could attempt to do it for durability testing. But uh, 
ergonomics of the people and the safety of our employees is really the primary driver for starting this project. The previous process where the human drivers drove the vehicle, it was a mix of events, some smooth roads, some rough roads, but on, a, on a, the truck procedures, we would typically run them for about four hours just because of the content of the procedure. Yeah. With a robot, obviously, you can run 24-7. It just has to come back to the building for inspections and fuel. So obviously, we get some time savings out of that, too. Right. We can call it a robot driver, but it's not a humanoid robot in the sense of the word. People always seem to picture that when we talk about robots. Yeah, that's correct. So we have a series of uh, actuators in the vehicle. The actuators are press on the brake, press on the accelerator, shift the vehicle, and then uh, we have a motor to turn the steering wheels. I'm heading out there now. I'm going to go and hop into the uh, F-150. I'll be riding shotgun today. Right. And we're going to take you down the roads that uh, are not fit uh, or too difficult for our drivers <laughs> not, to do. Not fit for human <laughs> consumption, is that what you're saying? <laughs>
<laughs> so this is the so so say this is a hose that you actually yeah. want to put on the car. Yep. It'll well. measure the posture that you're in, and then we can use that posture to predict how strong you would be, you know, in that particular posture. So strong. Oh, oh your head. Yep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> One of the other parts, I guess, uh, where it gets a little bit trickier is hand movement. But you yep. came up with a solution. So a few years ago, we were tasked with leveraging 3D printing and manufacturing. So we started cubing out you know, the CAD uh, digitally and 3D printing volumes so that now we have a physical model that can represent that card that doesn't exist yet. But then we can actually put real hands in there and, and communicate to decision makers and to the assemblers what that new space would look like and obtain feedback. We can really prevent issues down the road. And the stats are showing we're seeing about 75% fewer uh, ergonomic related injuries on the plant floor as well. So not only are we catching fewer issues when we yep. start making the prototype cars, but when it starts getting built on our plants, fewer operators are being injured. When we head down the autonomous path, a major concern is are we doing ourselves a disservice and putting all of ourselves out of work? Is that the case with this? Well, not really. It sort of just transitions the work from one group of people to another. So you're going from it. Driving takes a lot of skill, but uh, working on uh, wiring and, and computer you know, and actuators, it's a different skill set than driving. So yep. there is opportunity for the, you know, the people that are driving to move into that role. Do you see uh, a future where workers down the track could end up wearing some kind of Oculus Rift headset, controlling robotic arms, building cars without even touching them? Yeah. You know, there's definitely been a lot of advancements in VR technology, but there is a lot of industrially um, sound sort of heads up displays with augmented reality. There's been a lot of uh, work in that realm over the, the past few years. So it's not, it's not out of this world that that could potentially help our, our, some of our folks in the plants. Well, it looks like Ford are taking the term rough day at the office and making it somewhat less literal using the latest technology. And I'm sure there's more than a few employees out there heaving a huge sigh of relief. For TransLogic, I'm Jonathan Buckley. We'll catch you next time.